So let's continue with chapter 11. Chapter 11 is on heat exchanges. We've already done the different types of heat exchanges. We've done the overall heat transfer coefficient, the analysis of heat exchanges, and then we said that there are two general methods that can be used to solve heat exchanger problems. The first one is the lock mean temperature difference method that we've already completed, and the second one is the effectiveness NTU method. Now with the previous lecture we did all the theory, so let's do two examples to supplement the theory. And the first example we are going to do is example 11.8. It is based on the problem in your textbook. It is a counterflow, a double pipe heat exchanger. It should heat water from 20 to 80 degrees Celsius at a rate of 1.2 kilograms per second. The heating is to be accomplished by geothermal water available at 160 degrees C, C at a mass flow rate of 2 kilograms per second. The inner tube is thin walled and has a diameter of 1.5 centimeters. The overall heat transfer coefficient of the heat exchanger is 640 watts per square meter Kelvin. Using the effectiveness NTU method, determine the length of the heat exchanger required to achieve the desired heating. Okay. So let's draw the, the problem. It is a counterflow tube in tube heat exchanger. And schematically, that is how it looks like. So we've got cold water on the inside and hot water in the annulus flowing in opposite directions. In the annulus, we've got brine which is a salt type of water, a water with a high salt concentration. Most probably it will also be at a high pressure. Its temperature is 160 degrees Celsius and its mass flow rate is 2 kilograms per second. On the inside, the inlet is cold water. Inlet temperature of 20 degrees Celsius and a mass flow rate of 1.2 kilograms per second. The tube diameter is 15 millimeters and it is specified as a thin tube and it is given to us that the overall heat transfer coefficient is equal to 640 watts per square meter Kelvin. We have to determine the length of the tube, making use, and they specifically specify it, using the effectiveness NTU method. If we look at the two streams, the temperature as a function of X, then typically this is our hot stream with an inlet temperature of 160 degrees Celsius and our cold stream enters at 20 degrees Celsius. Okay. So that is what is known at the moment. Oh yeah, and, they, and it should heat the water to 80 degrees Celsius. So the outlet temperature of the water there is also known as 80 degrees Celsius. Okay, now if you look at this problem, you will see that we've got this inlet temperature and the outlet temperature and we've got the mass flow rate, which means that we can actually calculate the heat transfer rate of the stream, which must be equal to the heat transfer rate of that stream and therefore it would be possible to determine that outlet temperature and therefore you can calculate the LMTD and then solve the problem with the LMTD method also. But they specifically ask us to, to use the effectiveness NTU method. So let's do that. And then at the end, we're also going to check the results using the LT LMTD method. Okay. Now the effectiveness NTU method says let's calculate the heat capacity ratio, which is the mass flow rate of the hot water multiplied by the CP of the hot water. The mass flow rate of the water is 2 
and the CP of the water is given as 4.31 not 13, 4.31 it's kilojoules, so it is multiplied by the 10 to the third so that is equal to 8620 watts per Kelvin Okay, for the hot stream, the mass flow rate multiplied by the CP gives us 8,620 8, watts per Kelvin. Let's also do it for the cold stream. For the cold stream, it is the mass flow rate multiplied by the CP of the cold stream. The cold stream is 1.2 multiplied by 4180 and that is equal to 5,020 watts per Kelvin. Okay. Now C minimum would be the smallest of those two values. In this case it is the cold stream, but it doesn't always have to be. Okay. So C minimum is equal to 5020 watts per Kelvin, and C, the capacity ratio, is then equal to C minimum divided by C maximum. The smallest one divided by the largest one. C minimum is equal to 5,020. C maximum is 8,620. And that is equal to 0.582. Yep. Um, the CP value for the cold stream, is that determined from the bulk temperature? Um, from, yes. So that would be typically 50 degrees Celsius. Because we've got the water, um, the water is, we've got 20 and 80, so we can get it at 50 typically. <coughs> okay. Uh, if it was really the effectiveness NTU method, then you wouldn't have, then they wouldn't have given this. And then you can either use it at 20 or you can make an estimate. You can guess maybe the outlet temperature is going to be 60 or something like that and use the bulk. Now let's calculate the maximum possible heat transfer rate. The maximum is equal to C minimum multiplied by the hot water inlet temperature minus the cold water inlet temperature, the brine inlet temperature minus the water inlet temperature. C minimum is equal to 5020 multiplied by 160 minus 20 and that is equal to 702.8 kilowatts. Okay. 702.8 kilowatts. Okay, let's calculate the actual heat transfer rate which we can get from this stream. Okay. So we can say well, let's do it like this. Q is equal to QC. It's equal to the mass flow rate. TC out minus TC in. That is equal to 5,020 those two together because that is equal to CC multiplied by 80 minus 20 and that is equal to 301.0 kilowatts. Right, so the effectiveness is equal to the actual heat transfer rate divided by the maximum possible heat transfer rate. The actual heat transfer rate is 301 kilowatt divided by the maximum which is 702.8 kilowatts and the effectiveness is then equal to 0.428 which is 42.8 percent. Okay. 
Now for the counter flow heat exchanger, if we go and look in table 11.5, table 11.5, or in figure 11.26b, then we can use that effectiveness to get the NTUs. Okay. Or we can calculate it, as is shown in table 11.5. Lloyd, if you can just go up to it quickly. Table 11.5, for a counterflow heat exchanger, there the NTUs is given as a function of C and the effectiveness. Okay, so the NTUs is equal to 1 divided by C minus 1 multiplied by the lin of the effectiveness minus 1 divided by the effectiveness C minus 1. Okay. The effectiveness is equal to 0.428, so we can just do the substitution, and C is equal to 0.582. Or you can go and get it from the graph. Again, Lloyd, if you can just go up. The counterflow heat exchanger. There's the counterflow heat exchanger. In terms of the effectiveness, there is the effectiveness given. So if we use 0.428 and we use the C value, which is equal to 0.582, it would be very difficult to get a good value there because all the lines are very close to each other. But from that, the NTUs can be determined as 0.651. 0.651. Now the NTUs is equal to U multiplied by the surface area divided by C minimum. The NTUs is equal to 0.651, it's equal to U which is the overall heat transfer coefficient which is equal to 640 and the surface area of the tube would be pi multiplied by the diameter which is 15 millimeters multiplied by the length divided by C minimum which is 5020 from which we can determine that the length is equal to 108 meters okay take note there's a um, just a misprint in your textbook. It's not 1.08 meters, but 108 meters. <coughs> okay. So there's the an answer using the effectiveness NTU method. Let's also use the LMTD method. Okay, this part is not in your textbook, in the example. Okay, so using the LMTD, we can say, let's calculate the cold stream, which is equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by CP, multiplied by the outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature. We already, we've already done it, but you must consider it as if we haven't done these calculations before. So we start from scratch in terms of the problem. Okay, the mass flow rate on the cold side is 1.2, CP is 4180, and the temperature difference is 80 minus 20, from which we can calculate the heat transfer rate as 301 kilowatts. Okay, as we've done before. Okay. Now, let's calculate it on the hot side. It is equal to the mass flow rate on the hot side multiplied by CP on the hot side multiplied by TH in minus TH out. Now we've got the heat transfer rate, so it is equal to 301 kilowatts 
is equal to the mass flow rate, which is equal to 2. Cp is 4310 multiplied by the inlet temperature is 160 minus the outlet temperature, which we don't know, it hasn't been given. So we can calculate the outlet temperature as 125.1 degrees Celsius. Okay, 125.1. Right, now that we've got this temperature, 125.1, we can see that we've got all four the temperatures and we can therefore calculate the LMTD. Okay, so the LMTD is then equal to this temperature difference, 160 minus 80 is 80 degrees Celsius. 80 minus 125 minus 20 is 105.1 divided by the lin of 80 divided by 105.1 and that gives us an LMTD of 91.98 degrees Celsius which is 92 degrees okay. the transfer rate is equal to U multiplied by the area multiplied by F multiplied by the LMTD as if it is a counterflow heat exchanger The U value has been given as 640. Uh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, let me, we have to determine the area. We already have the heat transfer rate. The heat transfer rate is 301 kilowatts. Okay, it's equal to the overall heat transfer coefficient, which is 640 multiplied by the surface area which is equal to pi multiplied by the diameter multiplied by the length of the tube F is equal to 1 because it is a counterflow heat exchanger and the LMTD is equal to 91.98 from which we can calculate the length also as 108 meters <coughs> Okay. Any questions? Okay, let's look at the next example, example 11.9. Cooling hot oil by water in a multi-pass heat exchanger. Hot oil is to be cooled by water in a one-shell pass and an eight-tube passes heat exchanger. The tubes are thin-walled and are made of copper with an internal diameter of 1.4 centimeters. The length of each tube pass in the heat exchanger is 5 meters and the overall heat transfer coefficient is 310. Water flows through the tubes at a rate of 0.2 kilograms per second and the oil through the shell at a rate of 0.3 kilograms per second. The water and the oil enter at temperatures of 20 and 150 degrees Celsius respectively. Determine the rate of heat transfer in the heat exchanger and the outlet temperature of the water and the oil. Okay, schematically, this is how our problems lo problem looks like. Example 11. Point nine in the textbook of single and Gajar. Okay, this is the shell. Okay. And through the shell flows oil at the temp inlet temperature of 150 degrees Celsius, mass flow rate of 0.3 kilograms per second. And the CP value is equal to 2.13 kilojoules per kilogram degree Celsius. Okay, now it is a one shell pass and an eight tube pass heat exchanger. Okay, 
through here we therefore have eight tube passes one two three four five six seven and eight okay there are the tube passes the water flows in at 20 degrees Celsius a mass flow rate of 0.2 kilograms per second and the CP is equal to 4.18 kilojoules per kilogram degree Celsius. Okay, the tube diameters are 14 millimeters and each one of these tubes have a length of 5 meters, 5,000 millimeters. The overall heat transfer coefficient has been given as 310 watts per meter Kelvin. And I think that is all the information. So oil flowing in, flowing through the shell at 150 degrees Celsius, a mass flow rate of 0.3 kilograms per second, CP 2.13 kilojoules per kilogram degree Celsius. We've got one shell and eight tube passes. Through the tubes flows the water at 20 degrees Celsius, inlet temperature, mass flow rate of 0.2, CP 4.18 kilojoules per kilogram degree Celsius. Each one of these tubes, 5 meters in length, overall heat transfer coefficient, 310 watts per meter Kelvin. Let me just clean the board. Let's calculate the heat capacity ratio of each screen. CH is equal to the mass flow rate of the hot side multiplied by CP on the hot side. Okay, the hot side is the oil, which is at 0.3 kilograms per second, and the CP is 2130 because it is kilojoules. So it is equal to 639 watts per Kelvin. On the cold side is the mass flow rate on the cold side multiplied by CP on the cold side. The mass flow rate on the cold side is 0.2. CP is 4180. So that is equal to 836 watts per Kelvin. Let us just also schematically show the temperature streams. Okay. The temperature streams. And we draw it as if it is a counterflow heat exchanger. It is not, but we draw it like that. Okay, so the water is the, uh, the oil is on the hot side and it would enter at 150 degrees Celsius. We do not know the exit temperature and the water would enter at 20 degrees Celsius, that is the cold side, and we do not know the exit temperature. So that is a classical effectiveness into you method. Outlet temperatures are not known. Okay. Because the outlet temperatures are not known for one of them, we cannot calculate the heat transfer rate, we cannot get the LMTD method. You can do it by iteration, but it takes quite a while before it converges. Okay, so C minimum is the smallest one of those two. Which one is the smallest? In this case, it is CH. So it is equal to 639 watts per Kelvin and the heat capacity ratio 
is the minimum value divided by the maximum value. The minimum is equal to 639, the maximum is equal to 836, and that is equal to 0 0.764. The maximum possible heat transfer rate is equal to C minimum multiplied by TH in minus TC in. Okay. So C minimum is equal to 639 multiplied by the inlet temperature on the hot side, which is 150. The cold temperature, inlet temperature is 20. And that gives us a heat transfer rate of 83.1 kilowatts. Okay. Before we continue, before we continue with this problem, and specifically also addressing the question of the student from India, Okay. If we would like to increase the potential heat transfer capacity of that heat exchanger, what can we do? Okay. Except now, if we assume that temperature is a constant, and that temperature is a constant, and we cannot really change it. If we want to change the potential of this heat exchanger to transfer more heat, then we need to change C minimum. Okay, how can we change C minimum? We can change C minimum, the smallest one of the two, by typically increasing the mass flow rate. You see, the mass flow rate of the one stream is going to change that, the Q max. You agree? So that is the one thing that we can do if we want more performance out of this heat exchanger. Right. Let's calculate the surface area. The surface area is the number of tubes multiplied by pi, multiplied by the diameter, multiplied by L. The number of tubes is, it is an 8-pass heat exchanger, multiplied by pi, multiplied by the diameter, which is 14, multiplied by the length, which is 5, and that gives us a surface area of 1.76. 1.76 square meters. Okay, the NTUs we can also calculate. The NTUs is equal to the overall heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area divided by C minimum. U is the overall heat transfer coefficient. It has been given as 310 multiplied by the surface area is 1.76 divided by C minimum, which is equal to 639, and that is going to be equal to 0.854. Now looking at figure 11.26C, 11.26C, Lloyd if you can go up there, that is for a one shell pass and eight two passes. Look, one shell pass, two, four, six, etc. two passes. So this is the problem that we are busy with. Do you agree? Okay. So just look at the effectiveness. The effectiveness, we have to get the NTUs is equal to 0.85. Okay, so where is 0.85? It's approximately there. And our C value is equal to 0.76. So that is the effectiveness of our heat exchanger. Okay. So the effectiveness is equal to 47%. It can also be calculated from a table which has also been given. 
table 11.4. Let me see if I can get that quickly for you. Mm, no, I can't. Okay. But from one of the tables, you can also, you do not have to use the graph, but you can calculate the effectiveness directly from C and the NTUs. Okay. So now that we've got the effectiveness, we can say by definition the effectiveness is equal to the actual heat transfer rate divided by the maximum heat transfer rate. The effectiveness is equal to 0.47 is equal to the actual heat transfer rate divided by the maximum and the maximum is 83.1 kilowatts. So we can now calculate The actual heat transfer rate is 39.1 kilowatts. Okay, if we go up to the graph again, ladies and gentlemen, the one shell pass and the two passes of two, two, four, six, eight, etc. We are approximately there. Okay, which is not a very high effectiveness. What can we do to increase the effectiveness? What can we do? We have to. We are sort of on that line there of 0.75. So we see that it would not be possible to get an effectiveness more than about 68%. You see? Okay. And if we want to get there, we are going to be there with an NTU of about 3. Okay, so if we increase the NTUs to 3, we can get the effectiveness much higher. To do that, if we look at the NTUs, to get it to 3, we need much more surface area, which means that most probably it would be better for us not to have eight tube passes, but to take those tubes back through the shell a few more times. Obviously, if we change, if we keep the diameter of, of the shell constant, we are also going to increase the velocity in the shell. If that happens, then this heat transfer coefficient is also going to increase. Okay. But let's suppose it, it stays constant, we make the shell larger so that we keep this constant, then we can increase the effectiveness by just increasing the surface area. Okay. Right, now let's calculate the outlet temperatures. Now that we've got the heat transfer rate, we can say the heat transfer rate on the hot side is equal to the mass flow rate on the hot side, Cp on the hot side multiplied by Th in minus Th out. The heat transfer rate, we have calculated it as 39 kilowatts. It's equal to the mass flow rate, it's equal to 0.3. Cp is 2130 multiplied by 150 minus Th out. And we can calculate the outlet temperature of the oil as 88.8 .8 degrees Celsius. Okay, you happy with that? We can do the same on the cold side. We can say on the cold side is equal to the mass flow rate on the cold side, Cp on the cold side, multiplied by the outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature. Okay, on the cold side it is 39.1 kilowatts. It's equal to the mass flow rate, which is equal to 0.2, Cp, which is 4180. We want to calculate the outlet temperature, which we do not have. F. We've got the inlet temperature as 20, so that the outlet temperature can be calculated at 66.8 uh, degrees Celsius. Okay? Okay. 
let's go back to the graph again. We've said that we can increase the effectiveness of the heat exchanger by putting in more surface area. The other possibility is to say, well, why don't we use a two-shell pulse heat exchanger, another shell. So let's just quickly look at that possibility. Now, we've got a two-shell and a 16-tube pulse heat exchanger. So we take this fluid here and we put it through another shell again with eight times eight tube passes. Two shell pass and sixteen tube pass heat exchanger. Okay. What will then happen is our NTUs is going to double. Okay, let's look at this NTUs. If everything else stays is the same we are going to have 8 plus 8. Okay, so the NTUs is just going to double. So the NTUs is going to increase to 1.7. And then the effectiveness of the heat exchanger is going to increase to 65%. Not much more than that of a single shell one. And the heat transfer rate, if we do the calculations, is going to increase to 54 kilowatts which is about 39-40% increase in heat transfer rate. Okay. But if we really want to make a big difference in this heat exchanger, what is the right thing to do? If we really want to make a big difference, let's suppose we want to cool the oil from 150 to 20 degrees, uh, from 150 degrees Celsius. So the problem is about cooling off the oil. What would you do? What would give you the highest effectiveness? Look at the graph. And let's choose the single shell or the double shell, the two pass, it doesn't matter. Of all those lines, which one gives you the highest values? It is the one where C is equal to zero. When is C equal to zero? If we look at that ratio, C minimum divided by C maximum is equal to zero. It's going to be zero when C maximum is at its maximum. When does that happen? When we've got a condenser or a boiler. Okay. So if we would replace the water with an evaporator, with an evaporator. Okay. So in terms of on a TS diagram, we will have evaporation at 20 degrees Celsius. Now typically the easiest would be to use a refrigerant rather than water. Okay. Use a refrigerant in the, in the tubes evaporating at 20 degrees Celsius and then we will be on that line there. Okay. Okay. And if we then also want a very very high effectiveness if we would design it so that the NTUs is about equal to 3 the NTUs equal to 3 so if C is equal to 0 and NTUs is approximately equal to 3 so we will have to go and look how many two passes we must get through to get the NTUs equal to 3. Or, not only that, but also the overall heat transfer coefficient. Okay. So making the shell smaller so that the heat transfer coefficients can be higher would also help. And then our effectiveness is going to increase to... Uh, what is it? Effectiveness... NTUs of 3, that line there, that is about 95%. Okay. And if we look, look at the two shell pass heat exchanger, then we see exactly the same. Why? 
because that line C equal to zero is exactly the same equation for all of them. Okay. So it doesn't matter if we look at the parallel heat exchanger, look that line there, the counterflow one, or the cross flow ones. All of them, that line C equal to zero is the same line. Okay? Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? If not, thank you very much.